Good afternoon to all the participants. My name is Zhi Tangawa Mira, and I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a business development manager at the CSIR, responsible for advanced agriculture and food. And as part of the work that we do at the CSIR, and of course, other uh, national institutions of innovation in South Africa, one of the critical issues that we always have to look at is how can we make South Africa and the rest of Africa food secure? And today's session will mainly focus on a number of critical issues that are aligned to us having a resilient agriculture system in Africa through technology innovation. So just as a brief introduction, I am going to quickly go through some of the issues that have been noted, particularly in line with, you know, the resources that we need to use to produce, um, as well as, uh, you know, the issues around climate change and what it actually means for our continent. So I'll quickly share a, a few slides so that we can see what the background uh, to this topic is. And at the same time, the key speakers that will be talking to us in a few minutes. So as way of background, um, if we look at the state of climate uh, change in Africa, which was actually uh, in a report that was reported by the World Meteorological Organization in 2019, there's a significant increase in temperatures and sea level rises across the continent, which actually threatens uh, human health, it threatens safety, it threatens food and water security, especially for our continent. And according to the WMO Secretary General, uh, Petteri, he states that the growing impact on climate change on the continent is hitting the most vulnerable the hardest and it's contributing to food insecurity, population displacement and stresses on water resources. And if you look at, for instance, what happened over the last couple of years, there have been floods, there have been desert locusts that um, have been infesting a number of areas across the continent. And the La Nina event as well, in terms of the drought, it's just exacerbating the problem. And add that to the COVID pandemic, we stand to have a very um, food insecure continent in the next few years if we are not planning to be resilient and if we are not planning to use technology to drive change in this particular area. Just some key critical facts um, on the predictions in terms, for instance, of uh, rising temperatures. And it, it's very clear that in the next couple of years, there would be um, you know, significant warming and decreases across a number of regions in Africa and also increased rainfalls in other regions that were drier in the past. And this actually impacts not only issues around productivity, uh, especially in the agriculture sector, increased pests and disease damages, flood in terms of infrastructure that is being damaged, but it also impacts our GDP. And at a continental level, uh, it's estimated that there could be a decrease of about 2.25% in terms of the GDP because of the impact of climate change and these different weather conditions. So this afternoon, we'd really like to dive deep and discuss um, you know, how can we make ag the agriculture sector resilient against climate change and all these new uh, pathogens and pests and what are the technology solutions that can be used to drive this change? So the session that we'll have um, this afternoon will discuss key technology innovations for resilience uh, and strategies to use to overcome the technology divide. Also, you know, looking at the fact that uh, within the sector there is inequality, and we also need to be reaching out to, to the small scale farmers. So our speakers. Uh, this afternoon uh, come from different institutions representing uh, various uh, types of work that they do across the, the, the region. One of our speakers is um, uh, Dr. Brianu 
Bidane from FAO, and he provides coordination and technical support to livestock related activities, programs and projects run by FAO in Southern Africa. He holds a master's degree in tropical veterinary medicine from the University of Edinburgh, a doctor of veterinary medicine, uh, a degree a postgraduate diploma in GIS. And we also have Dr. Zibane Tlatlapa from the CSIR, who is a computer scientist who is passionate about contributing to positioning South Africa as a leader in the fourth industrial revolution. His research covers several fields of networking and his work involves developing components of technology to bring internet access to rural um, areas where internet is not easily accessible. And then of course we have um, Prof. Sue Walker from the ARC, who is the principal research agrometeorology uh, at, at ARC, focusing on soil, climate, water in Pretoria. Uh, she's a professor at Emirates in Agromet and at the University of Free State. Uh, her PhD is in plant uh, physiology from the University of California, Davis in the US, following her studies at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in agriculture meteorology. She develops climate service uh, translating scientific uh, results into useful operational messages with experience in Southern East Africa, as well as Southeast Asia on agrometeorological and developmental projects. So this is the panel that we have this afternoon. And to kick off, I will ask Prof. Sue to uh, give an overview of the work that she does and her view on this particular topic. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm going to talk today about uh, climate change and the water energy food nexus and how this can lead us to efficient, sustainable um, agriculture. So I think everybody knows about climate change. And um, so maybe uh, we can have uh, a quick introduction uh, in general, over South Africa and Southern Africa, um, the rainfall up to 2100 from different models will show a very wide variation in the predictions. So these are six independent models, and you can see that this is the time on the x-axis and the amount of rainfall, and there's a lot of variation between what the different models are saying. And so we have to take this into consideration when we're looking at climate change in our own region, and we need to be able to know which is the best model for, for our region. If we look at the temperature though, um, still going up to 2100, we can see that all these same six models actually agree. So we can see that uh, by 2050, um, there will be an increase of more than two degrees. So we can take this into consideration when we're looking at the agriculture production and everything. So if we look here at the climate, um, which is really the driving force for uh, crop growth, then we know that um, the climate is really determining the boundaries of our crop suitability. So for instance, here on the bottom left-hand side, you can see uh, some maps for um, the suitability of maize in the different rainfall regions and how it will shift uh, from uh, 2015 through to 2090. And so we need to take this into consideration when we're planning our projects. We also know that the extremes uh, that were mentioned in the introduction also will cause major crop failure. So this can be cold temperatures, or high temperatures that induce heat and water stress. And then we know that we must look at some early warning systems and what can we do to bring drought preparedness for our farmers. So um, we can look at some ways of considering it. One is 
to look at where the uh, climate zones are shifting. Another way is to look at it using crop models. And here's the maize and wheat yields from IPCC um, predictions. So if we go to the water energy food nexus, we must remember that a nexus is just a connection of different things. Maybe that word scares us sometimes, but it's things or people or events. And we have to follow the chain of causation or, or, or cause and effects. And so for us, we want to look at how these sectors are linked, agriculture, in energy production, water, tourism, forestry, mining, and industry. And of course, linked to where our urban population and rural populations are situated and how they're generating their income. And so really, we all know that the water resources and the food are really the basis for survival and for the development of a safe haven, especially in the semi-arid and arid regions of Southern Africa. And yet energy is the lifeblood of the economy. So if we have one liter of water, do we rather give it to a farmer or do we rather give it to the energy generating people? Or do we give it for forestry or do we give it to the municipality uh, for human consumption. So these are some of the things that are coming into consideration when we're looking at the water, energy, food, WEF nexus. So we really need to look at the livelihoods of all South Africans as they're dependent on water for domestic purposes, for agriculture, uh, for industry and energy, and also remember the silent ecosystem services. So we have to consider all of those sectors in, in this WEF nexus. So what do we do in WEF nexus? We, we have a project where we're looking at the catchment level WEF nexus. And here we're going to look at different relationships first between water and food. We know that uh, if there's more water available, we can have a higher food production in the field. We also then need to look at water energy, how much water is needed to produce the energy that's needed. Can we convert to some green energy production systems that maybe use less water? And then also, how does the food energy system work? So for instance, if you take sugar, we need to take uh, sugar cane, water is needed for the irrigation of the sugar cane. Um, Water is needed to generate the energy for the pumps and water is needed for the energy for the processing of that sugar. So the sugar needs to be taken to the mill. It then needs to be purified and uh, packaged, etc. And then also the transport and logistics to get it to the people who are going to use it. So we can analyze all these different things and we can look at them in the current situation and we can then compare the future scenarios. So if we look at efficient agriculture and sustainable agriculture, we can also look at it at different levels. We can look at the catchment level, how much irrigation water is available, can we take it to the farm, can it be stored, and then to the field, how much is needed for our crop production. If we want to address climate change, then we can consider some of the climate smart agriculture uh, opportunities. So we need to have flexibility in identifying different crops using crop models. We maybe need to look at adaptations. Can we change varieties or can we have alternative crops or intercropping? And then what other coping interventions are there like water harvesting or using the seasonal forecasts? And I believe that we can provide some climate services or advisories and these will then use the best current science and the results and be able to take the current situation and be able to give information to the farmers and advisors. And this would be via high-tech communication, such as cell phones and apps. And so we need to integrate all of these uh, technologies and methods. And we need to use the climate models, the crop models, and the weather forecast to be able to apply that for our planning of continued sustainable agricultural productivity. We can use the water energy food nexus analysis to be able to help us to balance and 
find the trade-offs for the cross-sector integration and therefore the optimization of that kind of decision making. And we can develop operational climate services and advisories that will give us early warning of uh, conducive weather conditions, such as planting dates or when to irrigate or when to spray according to the expected climate conditions. So this can be from the daily conditions now forecasting for the next few hours, or it can be over three or four day period, or it could be over a 14 day period. It can also be using the seasonal forecast using El Nino and La Nino as our uh, chairperson introduced, and that could then help us with uh, deciding on what cultivars or crops to plant. So overall, we need to make further developments and take our science to the users. And we need to be able to do this in transdisciplinary teams. I thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think without wasting any time, let's move on to um, Dr. Bidane to speak on the work that you are doing at FAO and particularly on pandemics and epidemics, by looking at animal and plant diseases and pests, technology innovations to combat um, pandemics. Please go ahead, Dr. Birani. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. I hope you can see my, my slides. Yes. Uh, yes. Good yes. afternoon to you all. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the different pandemics and epidemics, mainly the animal and plant diseases and, and pests and uh, the technological innovations um, we are using to, to control them. My, my presentation is brief. It has about four uh, areas. Um, focusing mainly on animal and plant diseases and pests and the technological innovations used with some introduction and conclusion at the end. One of the major challenges Africa is facing today is feeding its current and future population in a sustainable and environmentally friendly manner. About 282 million people in Africa, that is close to 300 million, faced hunger in 2020, and 46 million more than the, the year 2019. As you all know, that is the complication with COVID-19, which contributed to the worsening situation. On the other hand, uh, on average, the African population is growing at a rate of 2.5% per annum, more than double of the growth rates in other continents. As a result of this population uh, growth, the current 1.3 billion population of Africa is projected to double to 2.5 billion by the year 2050. By then, about 1.5 billion people live in urban areas. That is about four folds of the current uh, figure. Compared to the rest of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa is the only region where staple food production per capita is growing far lower than the population growth. There are many factors you see here, uh, which are slowing growth of production and productivity of staple food uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. But my focus out of all what you see on this screen is the high prevalence of animal and plant diseases and, and pests. So the objective of the presentation is to take you through the pandemic and epidemic diseases and pests affecting staple food sources in Africa and highlight the role of technological innovation in the prevention and control of this. Before going to the, the plants, uh, the, uh, the animal and plant diseases, probably it is a good idea to have a look at the staple food, uh, both from crops and from animal, pro animal products used in, in Africa. 
As you see, maize, rice, and, and wheat constitute about 94% of all cereal consumed in Africa. Maize alone is the staple food for 300 million people in Africa. The consumption of rice is on the increase, especially in Western African urban areas, and it is projected that it grow to 30% by the year 2026. Wheat, in the same manner, is one of the preferred um, uh, cereals for bread, biscuit, pasta, as you know, nodules, um, and that is also uh, forecasted to, to increase with population growth and with urbanization. Cassava, another uh, root crop, 70 million Africans depend on it. And as a matter of fact, it was identified by the African heads of states and government as one of the six strategic crops uh, for, for which uh, production should increase. And it is one of the crops which is used during lean periods as a food reserve. When it comes to animal products, as you probably know, uh, the consumption uh, is shifting with uh, the, the increasing middle class and urbanization. And the about 16.2 kilogram of meat per year uh, per annum uh, pro, um, forecasted for, uh, which was for 2013, this consumption is projected now to increase three times by 2050. The same is true for milk for about 2.6 times. Now, having looked at the, this staple food used in Africa and the, the preference which is shifting, what are the animal and plant diseases which are affecting these food sources? Probably one of the things which we, we need to, to understand from FAO's study is that pests destroy about 20 to 40% of the main food crops, especially maize, rice, and wheat. Fall army worm, which occurred in or, or spread to Africa in 2016, affects about, in addition to maize, about 80 cereals. This pest has spread from the Americas to 70, 70 countries in almost all continents at the, at the present moment. Maize lethal necrosis disease is a pandemic, has a crop loss of up to 100%. Rice plasts, as you, you've seen, about 50% yield is destroyed. Uh, wheat rust, the major epidemic, uh, is threatening about 37% of world wheat. Cassava, very important uh, staple food for Africans. There are three diseases, two viral and one pest, which are affecting, in the case of cassava mosaic disease and cassava brown streak disease, causing about 1 billion US dollars loss in Sub-Saharan Africa. Locusts, which was mentioned earlier, um, there are about four of them, uh, desert locust, African migratory locust, red locust, and brown locust are also a major uh, pest which are affecting uh, seriously our agriculture. Desert locust in Eastern part of Africa, and here in Southern Africa, the African migratory locust as you know, has a, a devastating effect still in several countries of Southern Africa. From animal diseases, four uh, are major, foot and mouse disease, a major uh, disease of uh, uh, ruminants, uh, basically cloven hoofed animals, including the Afri African buffalo, is a serious threat to our economy. And about two billion US dollars are lost every year uh, in Africa for uh, production losses and cost of vaccinating against foot and mouse disease. Uh, Peste Petit Rumina, the PPR it is called, affects about 70 countries in Africa and Asia with about 2.1 billion uh, US dollars lost globally. Pigs are affected by African swine fever. I'm just taking some of the diseases and those which are causing major, major pandemic and epidemics and not the detailed list of all the diseases. Time does not allow for that. 
50, more than 50 countries globally, except for the Americas, are affected by African swine fever. And this has a serious impact on pork production and trade. Avian influenza, you know very well, um, is uh, a zoonotic disease and it has a public health and trade implications. Now, what are the technical and uh, technological innovations which help us fighting these diseases and, and pests? Again, here I'm listing just a few of the, the possibilities uh, that exist, and like the enhancement of traits of plant and uh, uh, animals, um, technology, helps us in creating disease resistant animal. This is managed at a molecular level, as you know, through overexpression of gene rem removal or the introduction of a foreign gene, so that um, animals like uh, those which can um, resist trypanosomosis, one of the, the major diseases in Africa, can be um, a, a, a bred. So pest resistant crops like uh, the Bt maize, as maize is a staple food, is possibility by technological innovation. Pesticide resistant crops uh, like the glyphosate resistant maize in soybean, adding some supplements like the in the in the case of uh, the golden rice, and making plants adapt to hostile climate, salinity, and uh, things like that uh, is a possibility through uh, manipulating uh, at a molecular level. Digital technologies also give us um, advantage for monitoring and early warning. The real uh, time monitoring, like using wireless sensing, uh, uh, cameras, microphone sensors, in real time communication uh, facilitated by ICT helps us monitor uh, our animals in their farms and our crops in the field. Real-time disease reporting and early warning uh, is possible now using uh, something we call an FAO, Event Mobile Application Intelligence. This is a handheld device, a smartphone, for disease reporting. That is for real-time disease reporting to, for early warning and taking action. The same way we said about the fall army worm, um, it, uh, there is also a monitoring uh, application which helps uh, for monitoring an early warning system. Technology also helps us uh, in uh, providing digital extension using telephone hotline for farmers, the use of drones, remote sensing techniques for surveillance, prediction technologies, artificial intelligence and robots. All these are now facilities with technical innovation to help us in fighting diseases and, and pests. With a highly mobile and globalized world, uh, so, sorry, um, the, the rapid, accurate, and highly specific sensitive and sensitive detection uh, pathogens outside of the sophisticated laboratories is needed. This is something which we require on site, also known as a point of care. Um, there are different tests which technological innovation enables us. Molecular tests like the PCR. Uh, there is one interesting um, uh, uh, kit, which is uh, right now developed by um, CSIR in South Africa together with uh, Boca Bio uh, for the, the diagnosis of foot and mouse disease. This is one of the major diseases we said in South Africa right now and a couple of other countries in Southern Africa are affected. Having such tests close to the, the, where the animals are is really very important compared to the sophisticated laboratories which require days uh, to provide a uh, result while this is done in just an hour or so. Microfluid devices, lateral flow, all are, uh, these are new technologies which are uh, providing quick, accurate, cheap and portable diagnostic tools. Vaccines and pest control products. Um, most of you know that most of the vaccines had to be kept under refrigeration uh, to be effective. So producing uh, vaccines which can be stored at room temperature 
or carrying them into field without ice or without any refrigeration are needed. And technological innovations are providing the production of such thermoresistant vaccines or vaccines um, uh, customized to the exact need where it is needed. Also not included uh, as part of uh, the, the mainstream disease control, um, getting paid for resources uh, for, for the supply in the case of value chain is also one of the advantages technological innovation can give our farmers through e-commerce and digital platforms. As a conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I can say that I am not only the currently malnourished people in Africa, but the fast growing uh, population need to be fed uh, adequately in the coming years, for which we require to increase production and productivity of staple food and those which are required as the shift uh, in preference of consumption as the middle class grows. Uh, as unfortunately, there are several challenges affecting uh, the increase of production and productivity and uh, the prevalence of uh, the existing and emerging animal uh, and plant diseases and pests are right now causing huge losses. The fortunate part of it is technological innovations hold great potential to enable us uh, increase production and productivity and reduce on the ex excessive use of pesticide, antibiotics, uh, and less demanding product, uh, production techniques so that we can have a better uh, animal and plant health. With that, I come to my, the, the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bidani, for that. Um, I think we've heard from Prof. Sue on the water energy food nexus and the technology advancement that could enable us to have efficiencies in the agriculture sector. We also heard now in terms of, uh, you know, pandemics and epidemics and even pests and diseases, how technology can play a really good role in uh, improving how we monitor and even in certain instances fight against these new emerging diseases. Now we move on to the digital divide. And I will ask Dr. Tibane to go ahead with his presentation. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks colleagues. I think uh, it's, it's, it's clear that I would not be able to uh, talk uh, a lot about uh, the climate change and uh, as well as the disease and pests. Um, if you can go to the next uh, slide, I'm not sure what is happening with the, um, the full screen there. Um, so what I will start uh, up with is just uh, to look at um, what we can call the future of food. And, um, and, and this is uh, the, the map that has been created by the World Economic Forum um, with the information that has been sourced from global publications as well as uh, some global events and with uh, interviews from global stakeholders, just to look at the whole ecosystem of the food um, uh, production. So the environmental footprint, I think we've already talked about that, it's been uh, covered here. Um, there's, a, there's also the issue of inclusivity. Um, and I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about that, even though the, my presentation is not going to focus on that particular side. The value chain efficiency was uh, touched a little bit in the past, uh, in, the, in the just uh, last presentation there, in terms of uh, understanding where food is going and maybe the condition under which uh, that food is being uh, distributed. Um, there's a uh, health and nutrition. Um, I think we also uh, understood uh, at some point that with the population growth uh, and our expanding middle class here, the urbanization is presenting uh, challenges uh, for the food systems as well. Um, so those are uh, in, in totality some of the things that have come through. But I'll focus a little bit, I'll focus on the food uh, and the innovation, food technology and the innovations that are there. 
Um, and if you can go to the next slide, um, and I'll highlight a little bit around uh, that issue. What is uh, happening is that the inno innovations uh, focus on food systems are recently, only recently behind many of the other technologies. Um, are adopting some of the uh, foundation technologies of the FYR, such as the Internet of Things uh, and the use of drones for collection of uh, data um, and the use of artificial intelligence to draw a lot of the insights from that particular tape data and enable decision making. Of course, uh, uh, we have the blockchains that uh, assist with the, with the recording of the transactions and being able to have a traceability um, in terms of what is happening across all the value chain. But even though there's, a, there's this in, uh, new thing, you can see that the balance of investment is still uh, in other areas as, as compared to uh, the healthcare related startups uh, in terms of the funding. Um, you know, the investment in the, in the food forecast side, uh, it's, it's, it's around 14 billion uh, versus around 145 billion for the healthcare, uh, you can see that there's still a lot of, uh, you know, investment that needs to happen there. Just to, just to confirm that uh, I, I, I thought uh, I'll make sure that the wet wave disappears from my presentation. Uh, that wave doesn't mean World, Economic, World Environmental Federation, it means uh, World Economic Forum. Um, so if you look at, the things that we need to do. So if we want to do this uh, transformation of the uh, food systems, as particularly from the technology side, it is very important that we look at the policy as a whole, and I'll highlight some of the issues from the policy perspective uh, that needs to be uh, encountered and increase oh, the yeah. investment as highlighted that the investment is not at par with other uh, sectors. I went via the Zoom, that's why I sent you the link. Um, yeah, and then uh, we, no, we will talk about mm -hmm. expanded uh, infrastructure. Um, mm. So with, uh, with all of that, um, this needs to be, this investments needs to be made as well as a policy that needs to be improved in addition to the standard one of the increasing uh, the capacity for farmers as well as uh, changing the consumer behavior that uh, other speakers have talked about. So if you go to the next slide there, um, the, I just want to highlight here that uh, if you look at a small number of farmers, um, the, the idea here is that uh, we do understand that uh, the smallholder farmers um, are the ones that are leading in terms of the African pro, uh, food production. So that's, uh, that's where we need to focus in. Um, and in 2017, uh, this, uh, you know, areas had been highlighted as the areas that needs to be uh, require the technologies. And this talks about the digital technologies. Um, and if you can go to the next slide uh, that covers the areas that uh, those particular areas. Um, so I will highlight those particular five areas. Go to the next slide, uh, five areas, and then in, in terms of what we need to do around uh, the policy. And I mean, if you look at the first one is improved access to electricity. This was highlighted as well. Um, so whilst we are talking about digital technologies, uh, in many cases, there's still not uh, access to electricity and whether it's that electricity or even uh, solar, uh, energy, but uh, access to energy is, is very critical for the expansion of the networks. Increasing the network connectivity, um, the way the mobile, uh, you know, uh, providers, uh, you know, plan their network extensions, they use the population, they go where there's a lot of populations, and we know that where we have a lot of production of agriculture, that's where there's less population, and uh, and it happens that those are not connected. So it has the policy has to drive that particular side because it has to drive the economic uh, growth in that uh, sector. So if you, if you highlight uh, and you look at all of those with the uh, mobile uh, devices and platforms and, as well as the unique identifiers. And when you talk about the unique identifiers and geospatial uh, analysis, 
those calls for data protection and data uh, sharing policies, particularly to, for the areas uh, uh, crossing the different countries. And you'd find that sometimes when people are looking at the data protection policies without looking at what is required in different sectors, um, then they may actually uh, put data protection policies that inhibits the, um, the different farmers to collaborate across different uh, across the region to be able to use uh, the data to uh, get the insights that they need. So those are the, the kind of policies that we need to look at uh, across the board and not necessarily just the, uh, the internet connectivity side. So we can, uh, we can perhaps maybe go to the um, next slide. Um, what I just wanted to highlight here is that uh, at the center, uh, the CFIR South Africa, the main aim is to be able to create the collaborative platforms that will enable uh, all of us to work together and see the connection between all of this. So when you look at the data policy as a central aspect, it enables all these other technologies that we have talked about, because if we have a bad data policy, it won't enable us to uh, take advantage of all the other technologies that will um, enable the smallholder farmers to be, um, you know, to be sufficient and to, uh, to have get got uh, enough insights to decide which area to you know to plant which um, crops at which time because it may change depending on the conditions that they have. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's basically uh, what I have. Uh, my last slide was just talking about the methodology that we can use to uh, all work together to make sure that we can create better uh, policies. And I think this is this calls for, for all the collaboration between uh, different um, entities, whether international like FAO um, and the local health academics working, coming together. But it's also highlight the fact that when we are talking about data policy, it may be that we are talking as the digital uh, you know, industry but we are not taking a loan. Whatever we will be doing there uh, affect all other sectors. And the agriculture would be one of those that will be severely affected if uh, we have data policies that uh, restricts the sharing of data between uh, people, between uh, researchers in different uh, areas and where we can have smallholder farmers uh, accessing that uh, you know, technology to be able to understand also the different markets that they have. I will, uh, I'll, I'll stop at that. Um, you can just maybe skip the next slide and go to the next slide, which is just a, um, the, yeah, you can ski, uh, skip there. So that's a, that's our our contact um, with uh, with that. But I think the, 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 the main point here is that uh, they are tracing the technology issue also requires addressing the policies that may affect uh, the sectors that uh, want to do the innovation. Um, and and this, is, this is how the whole ecosystem could work. Thank you. Thank you for that. Really great insights into how technology can advance the agriculture sector and also looking at other issues like policies, especially in a digital economy. Um, at this stage, we move on to the question and answer uh, session or discussion. And we already have one question for Prof. Sue. And the question is, how accessible are the focusing and decision-making tools to farmers, as well as how can they be made live? Meaning, for instance, if you have information on drought, uh, can this be relayed to farmers timely to allow them to make decisions uh, quite timely and then they are able to plant when they need to plant um, in good time? If so, um, may you also give some examples on that? Maybe while I'm asking the questions at this stage, it would be really great to hear from the panel in terms of, you know, technology versus some of the socioeconomic development targets that we have even across the SDGs, like a job creation. 
in some instances, we hear that um, there could be, uh, you know, jobs lost. And we know that within the agriculture sector, um, it's one of our biggest employers uh, as a sector. And so what is the balance in that instance? Perhaps one of the pan panelists can speak to that. And then of course, um, from a data perspective, uh, you know, when we talk about poppy, which has recently come in effect in South Africa, and we're trying to protect personal information, and we also want to drive collaboration with open data uh, infrastructures, so to speak, how do we balance that? So maybe questions for all three panelists, if you can answer in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, I will uh, try to answer your question about whether this information is available to farmers. During our Rain for Africa project, we found out that only a third of the farmers have um, connectivity via smartphone. And so when we were developing our AgriCloud app, we also tried to develop a USSD system. Unfortunately, uh, because of some of the rules and regulations about uh, supply um, and via the correct modes, we are not able to uh, run it at the moment on the DSST, DSS, DSST um, system where you, would, where you would get it on a simple phone. But the information is available uh, from ourselves, Agricultural Research Council. We have uh, a monthly bulletin, and we also there's also information available from the South African Weather Service, and also from uh, University of Cape Town and the University of Pretoria. So what we say is that we need to add some information, especially for the farmers. And that's what we did in our AgriCloud app is we took the information from the weather and climate and added the uh, agricultural intelligence or um, those algorithms about planting and how much rain is needed and the frost dates, et cetera, for specific regions. So there is some data available, but because of the accessibility on the smartphones, what we did in the Rain for Africa AgriCloud uh, project was that we addressed it more to the extension officers and advisors so that they would be able to load a number of farmers with their specific um, location GPS and they therefore be able to get that information. So some of the information is there, but there is more information needed um, and more development needed for uh, most of the applications. Thank you. Thank you for that. Maybe Dr. Tsvane, if you could speak to um, the Poppy Act and how we can try and find a balance with in terms of data sharing and also even from a technology versus job creation perspective. Okay, um, maybe, maybe let me just touch on the connectivity one that has just been mentioned. Um, and, and, and the reason I was highlighting the policy in this particular case is the fact that, uh, you know, the spectrum that enables the mobile connectivity is not a renewable resource. Uh, so, um, you know, it's already licensed. Most of it is already licensed to operators, but the operators are not, do not have any incentive to go to the areas there because they follow the population. And, and, the, and the policy, on the usage of the spectrum uh, could enable us to do that. And there are technologies that can enable um, sharing of that particular spectrum, but the policy is not enabling that particular side. The policy everywhere, uh, except in the US, they have the policy that enable the sharing of the uh, defense forces uh, spectrum, but we don't have the policy that enable that. So that's a, one of the issues around the policy to enable us to have the networks covering everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about the technology versus the social development, uh, social uh, um, development challenges, 
The, I think what we have just highlighted here uh, is the fact that those are, you know, intricately connected. Um, so, so you're talking about uh, technology coming on board as maybe uh, connectivity coming on board and additional uh, intelligence built onto that. And if that helps the farmers to have a higher yield uh, than they would without those, uh, it will actually start to solve those particular problems. And maybe some of the people that may have left farming because they were used to the old ways of uh, planting maize everywhere. And then uh, the shift has happened that maybe this particular place, you don't have to plant maize. Um, and they realize they are not getting anything. And then they left the farming area to go and look for jobs in the cities. If they see that uh, you can still uh, get something from agriculture, they could move back uh, and we have better, uh, you know, yield. So the technology in this particular case would uh, assist agriculture to be, uh, you know, uh, there. So I think when we start to talk about these technologies, um, things like uh, self-driving tractors are not necessarily the things that will be of interest to smallholder farmers. But what will be of interest is to be able to get the insights into how they could be able to uh, deal with these uh, issues. And finally, on the Poppy Act uh, uh, issue, the Poppy Act in terms of South Africa here, uh, Poppy Act does not uh, discourage collaboration uh, on data. In fact, it does allow uh, you know, cross-border sharing of uh, information. The only thing is that you have to do that when you have uh, the similar type of laws with the people that you are sharing. Because you want to be able to say, if they abuse that, then you can have a recourse if they have the similar kind of uh, sharing. So it's very important that uh, as African Union, we can create similar kind of uh, you know, laws that will enable us to share data seamlessly with each other as we, we go through this uh, particular process. Okay, thank you for that. We are out of time. Uh, we had one more question, but I think we are out of time. And with this, we really thank all the participants for the questions that you have put forward. Um, we will, of course, try and send the answers to the ones that we could not tackle in this discussion. Uh, and we appreciate your time. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the participants. And we hope you have a um, really great uh, time with, with the Bio Africa Convention for the next two days. Thank you. And goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much.